Hello and welcome to our program. Let's start this morning with a lovely thought for the day. You can't learn to walk without falling down. This is by Ashwin Sanghi. Welcome back. Every day charts a new history for the future. But every day also carries with it a history of the past. Let's take a brief walk down memory lane. In 1965, one of India's biggest film stars, Amir Khan, was born in Mumbai. In 1879, Albert Einstein, the German physicist, was born. In 1883, Karl Marx, the German philosopher and theorist, died on this day. But much before, in 1502, Vasco da Gama returned to Calicut, India, for the second time. In 1843, Boston conducted its first town meeting. Our guest today is special because, as a writer and as somebody who does such deep research, he has this uncanny gift, this uncanny gift of sowing very, very deep, random thoughts in your head first, and then linking them so beautifully and navigating his way through your mind with the thoughts so much so that suddenly all of them seem connected. There is really nothing random in how he speaks. There is something very beautiful and unifying in the way he puts things together. Please welcome well-known author Ashwin Sanghi. Thank you so much for having me. Ashwin, wanting to start again with the introduction that we gave you today. You know, you have this beautiful way, you put in such beautiful, wonderful, random thoughts and all of them are deep, whether you go back to history, whether you go back to Chanakya, whether you talk of Krishna, all linked to history and mythology and actually make them so real, somewhere bringing a beautiful interconnectedness across the universe. How do you do that? You know, as they say, easy reading is damn hard writing. So it does require a lot of effort. Uh, but I think to a very great extent, um, there is a fundamental interconnectedness in the universe in general. Uh, it's just that we don't, in ordinary course, we don't end up seeing those connections. Uh, so what at least I like doing, and that is what fascinates me, is precisely those connections. It's, you know, there are those who say, Ashwin, you're a mythology writer. Mm -hmm. There are those who say that you write historical fiction. Someone else calls me a conspiracy fiction writer. Uh, frankly, none of those in and by themselves interest me. It's the overlap between those, what you talked about, connectedness. Uh, it is the connections between those spaces that fascinates and excites me. I've always believed that if you take the two words, myth and history, mm -hmm. and bring them together, then you get a combined word. And that combined word is mystery. And that's what I write. Lovely. In fact, every time one hears you speak, and even when going through your books, you can sense that your aha moment is when you see the link and when you see the interconnectedness. You Absolutely. Know. Right. Absolutely. And very often, of course, those linkages are not entirely... Uh, uh, I think the, the great liberty I have is the fact that I'm a fiction writer. Uh, so if I see a connection, I can present it to you without having to present a thesis, without having to prove myself on many of those issues. Uh, so for example, if I see a commonality in the shape of a shivling and the Baba Atomic Research Center, I will present it to you as a part of my story. Right. Or if I see a connection between uh, the holy, holy number 786 and the Om, I will present it to you. Right. In my recent book, uh, Keepers of the Kal Chakra, if I see connectedness between quantum physics and uh, what our ancient sages were telling us uh, through Vedant, then I will present it to you. Right. Uh, so uh, more than a writer, I am someone who tends to see connections. Right. So coming to the Keepers of the Kal Chakra, how did this idea originate in your head? Well, actually, it started with a nightmare. Uh, and, you know, sometimes you end up going through a bad dream, which seems very real. And I got up in the morning and uh, it, it seemed almost as if the dream was another life. You know, it was a dream which was very, very real. And you wake up exhausted uh, because of the dream. Okay. And I told my wife, I said it was so real. I felt I was living the dream. Uh, 
and I said, you know, what if the daily life that I lead, writing my books and going to work and traveling in the car and talking to people, what if that is a dream? And what if my dream state is actually my real life? Uh, isn't it possible that what I'm going through in my real life is actually someone else's dream? Wow. Uh, and so that is the notion of dualities uh, which came to me that uh, is it possible that we are connected and could it be that when I sleep I'm li living someone else's life. So you slip in from one parallel to another parallel. To another parallel. And once I started exploring that then that took me into the world of quantum theory mm -hmm. and the concept of quantum entanglement uh, where which talks about the fact that you can have uh, two particles, two very very basic particles uh, separated by thousands or millions of miles and they can actually uh, uh, look almost identical in terms of their uh, speed, their velocity of rotation and they are almost identical in every respect because they are intrinsically entangled. So isn't it possible that human beings are also entangled? Uh, isn't it possible that planets are also entangled? Uh, could there be a could there be a twin Earth spinning millions of miles away? Uh, and so that was the fundamental uh, concept which drove keepers of the Kal Chakra. Right. To a very great extent, the way at least I see it is that the world uh, is not that much about you and me. It's much more about the fact that, for example, you and I are talking, and I'm wondering to myself that are you real? Mm -hmm. uh, is it possible, I mean, for example, quantum theory talks about wave particle duality. Okay. That something could be a wave or it could be a particle. And of course, that is exhibited very clearly by light, uh, which can behave both as wave as well as particle. Currently, I see you in particle form. Mm -hmm. You're real. You're, you have mass. But what if you are actually a wave which becomes mass or an object when I observe you. Right. So isn't it possible that the observer is creating the observed? What is? What if I turn my back on you right now and you are no longer there in a physical form? Uh, so these are the sort of questions that excite me tremendously. And uh, this book gave me a chance to be able to, to sort of explore a lot of that. Right. So when you talk of the Kal Chakra, how do you link that to quantum physics? Well, Kal Chakra, of course, is a is a concept from which comes to us from the Buddha. Uh, if you really take the word Kal Chakra, Kal means time, and Chakra means wheel. Right. So it's the wheel of time. And uh, during the last life of Gautam Buddha, uh, he was uh, uh, preaching uh, at a little uh, village uh, in what is now uh, present day Andhra Pradesh. Okay. And uh, uh, one of his disciples. Uh, was actually a king who had come from a land up north. Uh, that kingdom, that fabled kingdom was called Shambhala. And Suchandra told Buddha, he said, well, you are an ascetic. Uh, you have renounced the world. So obviously you will attain moksha. But what about me? I'm living in the world. I have to govern a kingdom. I'm surrounded by worldly pleasures. So I will have no opportunity to be able to actually ever attain that state. Right. And the Buddha told him, no, you can live in that and still attain the status of a Bodhisattva. What is a Bodhisattva? A Bodhisattva is a enlightened uh, uh, soul that can attain moksha, but chooses not to in order to help others. Okay. So he, uh, uh, he said, you can become a Bodhisattva. And the way that you can do it is through a meditation technique. And that meditation technique was known as Kal Chakra. Now it is said that Suchandra went back to his kingdom after learning this particular technique and he taught it to his uh, successors. In fact, he even wrote okay. uh, an entire uh, paper on the Kal Chakra, which was passed down the generations. It was known as the Kal Chakra Mool Tantra. And uh, uh, over the years, uh, Kal Chakra became, uh, became synonymous with attaining a very pure spiritual realm. Uh, and that very pure and spiritual realm 
came to be known as Shambhala. Right. Uh, so when you really look at the meditation of within the Kal Chakra system, it is actually allowing yourself to dissolve into the universe. Uh, it is realizing that uh, there is no separation between you and the world around you. Uh, when uh, Hindu philosophy talks about Vasudev right. Kutum being, in other words, the entire family, uh, actually you take it in a much more literal sense that anything and everything is connected. The ground that you walk on, the food that you eat, the air that you breathe, the water that you drink, even your thoughts. Currently, you and I are talking, but our thoughts are entangled. True. Uh, everything uh, is a bunch of moving, complex, dynamic connections. And it is those connections that you are attempting to realize that, hey, listen, I'm just part of this moving complex, this moving web of interconnectivity. And if you look at the visual representation of the Kal Chakra, it is actually a, a set of wheels. And at the center, of course, is the Bodhisattva, uh, who is known as Kal Chakra. Right. But uh, uh, the Bodhisattva is accompanied by a female deity. Okay. And so, again, the play of duality, of Shiv and Shakti, of North and South, of heat and cold, of positive, negative, right. of male and female. Uh, at the end of the day, what you're searching for is oneness with the universe. Right. And so if you really think about what quantum physics is telling you and what the Kal Chakra system is telling you, or for that matter, what Shiv Tantra is telling you, it's exactly the same thing. Right. So when you do so much of research and, you know, Ashwin, you go really deep, you read books, uh, and before you string them in a story, and you say maybe it's not historical, but you also have a very beautiful take on really what is really history. Yep. Is it a perception? Is it only one person? Is it yep. warped? Is it truth? Is it lies? Yep. So just tell her, what do you think history is? My favorite definition of history is history is a set of lies about events that never happened, written by people who were never there. Uh, and so, you know, there, there are a lot of people who say that, well, mythology is lies. After all, we can't believe mythology. Uh, my take on that is, yes, mythology is a set of lies, which we rarely believe. History, on the other hand, is a set of lies that we have agreed to believe. Uh, so uh, both, you know, I mean, think about an event like, let's say, for example, the revolt of 1857. We call it the Great Indian Revolt or the Great Indian Rebellion of 1857. But if you ask the average school child in England, what is that? He will say it was the Sepoy Mutiny right. of 1857. So the point I'm making is that history tends to be colored by those who are writing it. Uh, and uh, so to that extent, I am a cynic. Uh, I tend to read history uh, with a much more discerning eye uh, because I don't really uh, take it at face value. A lot depends on who had written it and where they were coming from. Uh, in that sense, I, act, I tend to actually take believe in uh, the deeper truth of mythology much more. Uh, because uh, it was Lewis who said that a myth is a lie that reveals a truth. Uh, so there is a deeper meaning to our myths. So undoubtedly, there is a lot of layering. Lots of stories have got added around our myths. Right. Uh, but there is a deeper truth which you need to search for. I mean, take for example, uh, our two greatest epics, the Ramayana and the Mahabharat. The Ramayana has 300 versions. And if you read one version and the other version, you'll find huge departures. I mean, uh, let's not even go into uh, all the 300, but take for example, Valmiki Ramayana and uh, Tulsi Ramayana. Uh, within the two, there is a huge departure because the Tulsi Ramayana treats Ram as God, whereas the Valmiki Ramayana treats him as just an ordinary human being. Uh, there are versions of the Ramayana in which it is Sita who kills Ravan by man manifesting herself as the form of Durga. Uh, there are versions of Ramayana in which Ravan is killed by Lakshman. There are versions of the Ramayana in which Ravan does the uh, final, uh, the final ceremonies prior to the battle for Ram. 
Okay. So there are multiple versions of the very same story, but they contain a deeper truth about good versus evil. Right. Uh, or for example, you take the Mahabharat. You started out with an epic called the Jaya, which was 25,000 verses. You went on to an epic called the Bharat, which was 50,000 verses. Landed up at the Mahabharata, 100,000 verses. I'm sure there's tons and tons of fiction along the way. There were enough Ashwin Sanghis of that time who were probably adding on their stories and layering these stories. Right. So in that sense, I would say that one needs to take everything that one reads uh, with a certain pinch of salt, sometimes right. sackfuls of salt. And I think one of the most beautiful parts about mythology is that it gives you sanction to interpret. Of course. That is the power because history somewhere does not allow you that sanction. And it you know, I must tell you, Goran, that that is something which uh, our country has had for the longest time. Because if we did not have that ability to be able to interpret, how would we have landed up with 300 versions of the Ramayana? So it means that those 300 were all accepted and we did not say that that is wrong and that is right. We said all 300 are truth. And just because my truth exists, it doesn't mean that your truth is less. Because all 300 contain the truth. We keep forgetting what it contains, but we keep trying to say, but this is how I interpret it. That's right. And then when the I becomes right. more important. Ashwin, when you research, and your research is very deep, your research is something which I think somewhere everybody wants to know, oh my God, but I always looked at it like this. And then you turn it around and you show another mirror. It's deep, it's layered and your mind is fertile, works in many directions. How do you get a single stringing narrative? How do you know how to cut the clutter? If you really look at my books in the Bharat series, the first book was The Rosabal Line. The next book was Chanakya's Chant. The third book in that series was The Krishna Key, followed by the Sialkot Saga, and of course now recently Keepers of the Kal Chakra. For all of these books, if I recall correctly, you interviewed me at the time when The Rosabal Line Right. had just come out. That was around 2008. Uh, now we are sitting in 2018, 10 years. In 10 years, there have been five books in the Bharat series, which means that the average book takes about two years to right. craft. And what it involves typically is almost about eight months to a year of research. Uh, and that research can be varied. For example, with the uh, Chanakya's chant, it was reading two particular works. Uh, one was the Arthashastra and the other was Mudra Rakshas, which was a Sanskrit play written by Vishaka Datta almost 700 years after the life of Kautilya, uh, which is the commonly accepted story of Kautilya. Right. So that was for Chanakya's chant. Uh, on the other hand, for the Krishna key, I actually ended up doing a lot of traveling. Uh, so for example, I went to places like Dwarka, Bet Dwarka, uh, Mathura, uh, Vrindavan, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Sialkot Saga was actually a ton of interviews uh, because uh, it's the story involves two individuals, uh, one's uh, life happening in Bombay and one's life happening in Calcutta. And these are stories over 70 years. Okay. So till the time that I could not speak to people who had lived in those cities, uh, I would not have been able to be able to uh, create the atmosphere of that particular city. In the case of um, Keepers of the Kal Chakra, it was actually sitting for hours on end with a few friends who were IIT engineers mm -hmm. in order to understand the fundamentals of quantum theory because I'm not a scientist. So I, I wanted to first actually teach myself quantum theory, at least the basics, before I could start writing this book. So once the research phase is over, then the second stage is plotting. And I have always believed that if you're going on a journey, uh, you know, where you plan to meet up with someone uh, after, let's say, a thousand odd miles, uh, then both of you should have a map in hand so that you meet at that right place. Uh, otherwise, you're likely to miss each other. Right. So if you need to bring all the dots to connect, you need to actually plot. Uh, every twist, every turn in the story should be pre-plotted. I've always believed that the sort of books I write are not an art form, they are a craft form. So with a carpenter who's chiseling chairs or tables, 
uh, he becomes better with the hundredth or the thousandth because his hand becomes that much more stable and uh, he becomes that much more confident uh, of what he is doing. Okay, the best way of explaining this is let's say a book like the Sialkot Saga starts from around 1947, ends in 2010. Uh, if you look at my plot, it runs to about 15,000 words uh, and it's on a spreadsheet. Uh, okay. The first column indicates every year, 1947, 1948, 1949, all the way through till 2010. The second column and the third column contains the names of the two characters, the main protagonists of this novel. But what were their ages in that respective year? Now, based on their ages, what would they have been doing? Were they in school? Were they in college? Were they setting up a business? Were they indulging in their first romance? Were they getting married? Had they done something wrong and landed up in jail? What was happening in their lives? Then, what was happening in India, socially, culturally, economically, uh, in order to create the background? And then what actually happens in that chapter? So, in other words, I had each of those twists and turns plotted out before I even started writing the first word. So, then you pick up all the threads so that you can get the pattern. Pattern. And so, wow. by the time that I'm done with nine months or ten months of research, two, three months of plotting, then uh, the remaining eight, nine months is for writing. And writing is the easiest bit because it's almost like a children's coloring book. Uh, I mean, you already have all the outlines there and you just need to decide whether green or blue or red, you'll fill in to those little spaces because I already have it all in front of me. So there are those who say, do you ever land up with writer's block? And I'm rather ashamed to say I've never had writer's block because I already know exactly what I'm going to be writing. I think uh, as you've been writing the books, it's been getting better and better, lesser and lesser of reworking to do. Uh, absolutely. The, the, the Rosabal line went through something like around six edits. Okay. Uh, whereas uh, increasingly nowadays, uh, my edits are normally around two or three. Okay. Uh, I, I have not attained any sense of perfection. I don't believe there is anything called perfection. Uh, the, way of, the way I like to describe myself is I'm work in progress. So with every novel that I come out, with, I hope that there is a 5% improvement over my previous novel. And that's really all that I'm looking for. Right. And I think it's also very exciting for the reader because you know that if this is what the writer thinks, then the writer's just going to get better and better. The other part of it is that most often my readers do not know what they are in for. I think that's also a key element in that. Because if you think about it, the Rosabal line was fundamentally theology. Uh, it was a theology and connecting religions of India and dharmic religions to Abrahamic religions. Uh, Chanakya's chant was a political thriller. It was trying to connect the dots between the politics of today and the politics of 2300 years ago. Right. Uh, the Krishna key was a mythological thriller. It was fundamentally about could the Mahabharat have actually happened and could Krishna have been a historical person. Uh, the Sialkot saga was a business thriller. It was about two businessmen and the rivalry between them. But of course, giving a lot of exploration into Indian history, 70 years of modern contemporary Indian history. Right. And of course, now Keepers of the Kal Chakra is much more of a scientific thriller. I would say it's almost sci-fi right. in that sense. For you, what is creativity? What is original? And is there something that nothing is original? Everything is from somewhere? How do you see all this? Oh, well, to, to my mind, I don't think that there is any originality left. Uh, it's a question of how those ideas are presented. So, for example, if we take, let's say, our myths, uh, the Ramayana has been presented to us in 300 different ways. Uh, what is it that Ashwin Sanghi can do uh, in order to make that, that myth more appealing uh, to today's generation? So contextualization. For, contextualization and also uh, maybe uh, the possibility of explaining how this could have a rational explanation. Today's kids don't want to read yes. stuff that, well, you know, there was a Pushpak Viman which suddenly took Ram from Lanka to Ayodhya. 
uh, or for example the idea of levitation i mean you know my nana ji the one who actually started who got me into the habit of reading uh, the old man used to send me a book every week to read really and that's where my habit for reading came mm-hmm. from but he was also a fascinating storyteller so he used to tell me uh, this story about how he had gone uh, to banaras and had met with a holy man and the holy man had asked him to shut his eyes in meditation and which he did the holy man was across him and uh, he said aank band karo so he closed his eyes and then uh, a minute later he said open your eyes and when my nana ji opened his eyes uh, the holy man was gone so he looked left right aage piche all all over and he wasn't there and suddenly there was a voice he said murkh upar dekh and he looked up and the holy man was levitating mid air now when my nana ji told me this story i really thought that my nana ji was consuming narcotics mm-hmm. you know i mean that there was something wrong with the old man mm. but today i believe in it because i just be- i realize that just because i can't explain it doesn't make it less real so true so uh, there is this uh, there is this uh, there is this notion that absence of evidence is not evidence of absence uh so to to my mind just because you you know i i remember when uh, uh uh i was having this conversation with none other than uh, dan brown okay and uh, we were conversing about uh, what is our notion of the greater power that is god and he said what is your definition and i had a little paper napkin with me and on that i took my ballpoint pen and i wrote g is equal to infinity minus k and i said this is god so he said now explain this i said well g is what we call god infinity is the world the brahman infinite in its nature infinite in its power and k is the extent of human knowledge so what we don't know what we don't understand that we attribute to the divine to a greater power to god and so there are many things which cease to be divine the egyptians thought of the sun as divine they called it ra right. they said he he gets up in the morning and he travels across the skies in his chariot and at night when it's time to sleep he goes off to sleep and it becomes dark, dark. later on galileo and copernicus and all of them they showed to us that it's a ball of fire mm-hmm. and energy and that we are rotating around it revolving around it and so suddenly the sun lost its divinity because now we could explain it and that's the very nature of everything around us that the moment we can explain it uh, there are many things at any given point of time that are not explainable and i hope to god that there will always be things which are unexplainable so that we realize that there is a greater power so you were from yeah. the business community you were in the business yeah. well versed in it and then from uh, you know keeping books you started writing books <laughs> yeah uh, my my munim ji at the office used to say that book keeping is more important than book reading the fact of the matter is that uh, when i wrote that first book of mine the rosabal line uh, i had 47 rejections for that book uh and a lot of people asked me how did you keep going at that time and i had in front of me a board which had the numbers uh 12 18 30 33 um uh and various other numbers written mm-hmm. uh so 12 was the number of times that jk rowling's harry potter book the first one uh philosopher's stone was rejected uh 30 was the number of times that uh 18 was the number of times that gone with the wind was rejected okay and uh, 30 was the time that a uh, number of times that stephen king's first thriller carry was rejected uh so i thought to myself that okay fine i'm beating each one of them and i'm getting more and more rejections i'm getting better and better i'm than getting better than them <laughs> uh so you it's a question of how you spin it for yourself because uh i believe that any creative pursuit or why only any creative pursuit uh, any pursuit is trial by fi- fire what we call agni pariksha and so you have to go through that process of uh, you know the brick bats mm-hmm. before you can start expecting the bouquets
Right. And I find that there are too many youngsters today who get disheartened uh, and they give up too easily. Uh, I am a firm believer that there are tons and tons of bestsellers out there, which potential bestsellers, mm -hmm. which never ever saw the light of day because the first few publishers said no or the first few literary agents said no. Uh, and that to my mind is very critical that we have to build our house with the rocks that people throw on us. So uh, what you know, really gets one persevering and going? It's conviction and belief. So in, in the Roosevelt line, what was it that convinced you, no, there's a story here, no, it'll work well? There, you know, I had spent almost a couple of years researching that story. And at the time when I was researching it, I didn't even know that there was a book in it. It's only because that was the first project. Right. Uh, it's only after 18 months that suddenly this notion struck me that, well, why not make this into a book? Why not write it up as a book? But I must tell you uh, what kept me going when those rejections were coming uh, was a little story uh, that was narrated to me by a family friend. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he used to come on weekends and uh, sit and have a drink along with my dad. And one day he noticed that I was looking rather forlorn. He was noticed I was depressed. And he asked, Peter, why are you so depressed? And I said, Uncle, I've written this book and no one wants to publish it. And he said, remember one thing, Bita, in, uh, in life, 99% is about good luck. And I said, but what about the 1%? The 1% must be hard work, efficiency, management, uh, talent, uh, networking, so many things. He said that 1% is known as bloody good luck. Okay. And he said, everyone has the 99% as well as the 1%, but you cannot control the timing of the 1%. You will also get your bloody good luck. Just wait for it. Be patient. Okay. And the two words in that are deep. patience and perseverance. Really deep. Ashwin, when we talk of luck, when we talk of success, when we talk of hard work, this book that you've written on success, on getting lucky in different ways, can we read a book and get lucky? <laughs> you know, I, I, I must tell you, a lot depends on what your definition of luck is. There are countless people who have given their own versions of what is luck. Uh, I think uh, one of my favorite definitions is the French actor Jean Cocteau mm -hmm. who said, of course I believe in luck. How else do you explain the success of those whom you don't like? Very uh, well said. Okay. You know? mm -hmm. uh, so th that is said in jest. But on the other hand, I believe that there is also a wonderful uh, definition given by the Roman philosopher Seneca who said luck is a matter of preparation meeting opportunity. That you know, and it's like a little bit like the rainfall example that I was talking to you about earlier, that the rain is there for all, but some people are prepared to collect the rainwater. So they will not run short of water because they've collected it. And there are some who go about life not worrying about when it rains and mm -hmm. allow the water to drain away. So that that preparation meeting opportunity is a critical element. Uh, so what I have attempted to do with 13 steps to bloody good luck, as the book is called, is really explain to you what is it that you can do in order to make those two things happen. In order to ensure that there are more opportunities coming your way and in order to ensure that you are better prepared for those opportunities. Right. Given the fact that 13 steps to bloody good luck, I mean, you know, it actually arose from a conversation at a literature festival and there was this young girl who had narrated the story of my family friend and the 1% bloody good luck. And she came up to me after the event was over and she said, but sir, if it's all about 1% bloody good luck, then in that case, I may as well sit in my house and watch television all day and wait for my 1% bloody good luck to kick in. And my publisher was standing next to me and we both burst out laughing. Mm. And he said, now... He told me, he said, I think you now owe it to her to explain what you meant. Yes. And so that's how that, that first uh, book in the 13 Steps series, right. uh, 13 Steps to Bloody Good Luck, was right. written. Ashwin, is uh, writing a solo project or are there collaborations and does that work? Uh, well, you know, I mean, I like to think of it as almost uh, like an orchestra. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you can have very good solo acts and then you can have wonderful Jugal Baddhis 
and you can also have orchestral uh, performances okay and uh, the advantage of course you don't get you don't get full play the way you would in a solo act but the harmony that is created from an orchestra is also very beautiful in its own way uh, so i believe that collaborative writing also does work but you need to be very methodical about it after the first book in the 13 step series we've done two more books 13 steps to bloody good uh, wealth and 13 steps to bloody good marks okay all of those are collaborative titles because i can't tell you the first thing about how to manage your wealth and i can't tell you the first thing about how to score well in exams because i never did so there are people who have that material but very often what they lack is the storytelling skills of a nashwan sanghi so we try and work together in order to craft uh, a book that will be easy to read and yet convey the sense of the subject also i think it carries with it a certain sense of so if you're saying you're talking about luck good luck success there is somebody who's experienced it both That's sides right. it carries with it experiential goodwill of course so we've done two books in that series private india and private delhi and again both were great experiences because uh, you know uh, typically the way we work is that one person will do a plot outline mm -hmm. the next person will actually develop the story or write the story mm -hmm. and then there is a uh, the 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 person who had originally written the plot outline will go back and do the editing and uh, the second draft of okay. the manuscript so it works very well what have been some changes in you as a person the way i described myself 10 years ago uh, i was a businessman who was trying to be a writer today i'm a writer who's trying to be a businessman okay uh, so uh, to a very great extent the way uh, it ha what it has done for me is uh, it has allowed me to structure myself uh, uh, for example uh, i never used to be an early riser uh, i'm up at 5 every morning uh, for my writing uh, since the last several years in fact i joke that most people have a 9 to 5 job i have a 5 to 9 job okay. because between 5 and 9 in the morning is when i do my writing right um it has also made me a lot more accepting uh you know the publishing world, world uh works at a snail pace uh so it's also taught me patience my family the value of my family mm -hmm. because i was you know i think to myself when a new book comes out and when it hits the best seller charts the the my first reaction is uh to share it with my wife or my son uh and i think to myself that would that have a value in their absence uh so i'm able to do what i do because of them uh 10 years ago i was already fully in the thick of my family business i had an mba in finance my father had been training me to take over things suddenly one fine day his son tells him dad i really want to do this and i i have a tremendous sense of gratitude to the man that he allowed me mm. to pursue my own direction and go in the direction that i wanted so there are so many blessings you begin to count your blessings there are very few people who are able to do what they really love doing mm -hmm. and that is really where i am that i've been able to do what i really love doing do you think slowly in this age of the internet we are losing the art of writing not really i must tell you i i think uh, there are a large number of people who are very active for example on social media they are very active on their blogs of course they write their sometimes they write journals in long hand also which is beautiful yes. it's 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 wonderful uh but i think there are that many more opportunities to write and to be read uh for example 10 years ago if you wrote a book uh uh you had no alternative if the top 10 20 publishers said no to you today you can just self publish uh your book becomes instantly available on kindle and there are countless examples of self published authors who've been extremely successful right. and sell in the millions uh they even make it to the new york times best seller list very heartening you know so uh, i think the opportunities to write have actually increased okay uh, uh but uh and of course if you look at the book market itself it's growing year on year at almost about 19% in india which means that the 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 reading habit is also catching on even though we like to maintain that no 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 one reads anymore another study found that the average book is read only up to page 18 
which means that now for us as writers, the true test is in how to engage our readership because attention spans are falling dramatically. Absolutely. So how do you get the reader to turn the page? That's critical. That's what a good story is about. And that's how you do it so beautifully year, year on year, book on book. Wishing you all the best, Ashwin, for your future projects. But thank you so much in coming and sharing your thoughts and your writing process and your writing plan. And I think the sheer way of how you see creativity and history. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gaurav. It's been a pleasure being here. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed our conversation with well-known author Ashwin Sanghi. Till next time, Namaskar.